Um, before we start with, um, with my presentation, I'd, I'd just like to make an observation from yesterday, from Peter's talk. Um, if you cast your mind back to the large pen over Europe that, that he showed you, um, the left-hand foot of that pentagram at the, at the southern bit of Italy is interestingly close to um, where Pythagoras had a school at Crot Crotona. And uh, <laughs> that can't be, can't be a coincidence, can it? It's, uh, it's, it's wonderful how these synchronicities uh, occur. And, and of course, as you probably all know that the, the pentagram was the emblem of the uh, Pythagorean school. And uh, there he was sitting at one of the major junction points of, 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 of the Peter's Grail landscape. Um, we get on with, um, with Lou now. Um, what I'm going to talk, talk about today is, is, is the, the strange presence of Lou within the landscape of London, uh, um, which takes um, many forms. And um, just briefly, uh, I, I'll fly over some information about who Lou was. I mean, Anthony's covered most of it. Um, but um, it's essentially, um, he, although he gets mixed up with the, the sun gods, I, I think he's more associated with light and has pow the power of the sun. Um, and in the, in the old Celtic um, traditions, the, um, the sun actually belonged to the goddesses, Ain and, and, and Bridget, the, the daughters of the Dagda, the great god. Um, and Lu is, is one of the shining ones. He is light, and he bears the light of the, of the, of the sun. Sorry, the, sli the slides have come out strangely small for, for uh, some reason through, uh, through the projector today. Um, as as um, Anthony mentioned earlier, we're going to overlap a little bit on, on some of the th things that come up in the talk. The, uh, the River Lee takes its name from, from Lu, the, the ancient Celtic sun god, and uh, flows through north and east London from Enfield um, right down to the Thames. And most references to the name simply say that it means shining or bright. Um, but it, it, it derived from, from Lu, the shining one, the, the, um, the um, ancient god. And the, the, the link with Lu is confirmed with, with its source, which rises in Luton, um, which is, is Lu's, Lu's town. And, Luton, I think, often gets overlooked, well, it does get overlooked as an important energy centre. It's, it's an amazing place. As, as Anthony said, it has the Michael line going, um, going right through it. Um, it also has a direct line from, from Stonehenge to it. There are several old wonderful hills in, in the town itself, as well as Wildwood's Bank. Um, and this... This is the, the actual source of the, uh, of, of the River Lee. It doesn't look much there, but it must, must have been taken on a, on a dry day. Um, but of course, it picks up so many tributaries on the way that it grows to the, the powerful river that we know. <coughs> and this, this is um, a, an old map of, of, of Luton showing Wallard's Bank. Um, <coughs> And according to local legend, the spring is presided over by, the, by Lu, Lugus, Lud or Lig, that's a quotation from, from um, a, a local history book. So it's got a direct link to, to Lu, uh, because all those are uh, different appellations of the, of the same god. And Wallard's Bank is actually in the district of Lee Grave, which is an, an, another connection to the, the, Lou, the Lou name. And you can see um, that the Wallard's Bank has actually still got some pretty tall embankments and earthworks around it. It's, it's um, jolly good. This, um, unfortunately, it's got a few other things around it as well, because the, the Luton Council decided it was a great place to put a few tower blocks in the 60s, and, and they don't really um, <laughs> add to the atmosphere. 
And of course, um, the, the Lee ends up in, in the Thames um, here, just opposite the, um, <coughs> the terrible dome, um, um, and, and close to Canary Wharf. And uh, it passes the Olympic Village and the Olympic Stadium on, on the way. The, uh, do, do, do you think we could close the um, curtains on that side and, and put a couple of lights down because the, um, the slides are coming up a bit dark? Thanks. And this, this is how close the, um, the, the River Lee gets to the Olympic Stadium. It, it, it's actually enclosed by water on, on every side, like a, a sacred enclosure, um, which is quite interesting. Um, so I, I, I've got a sneaking suspicion that there's, there's, that 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 this is some kind of sacred space that's being created there. Um, I've, I've flicked through these fairly quickly because it's just running through the route of the um, the lead down through Enfield and Chingford and Waltham Abbey and. Chess and, and Broxbourne. Actually, at Broxbourne, there's a, there's a great place where you can turn up and hire a bicycle and cycle along the, t the, 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 the park beside the Lee all the way up to Ware and Hartford. And uh, on, a, on a sunny afternoon, it's a terrific way to, um, to, to take in a pilgrimage of, of, of the river. And um, earlier in the year, we did get round to doing a, 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 our own pilgrimage to, um, to the River Lee. We went to the Hartford end of it, um, where the River Lee joins with three other rivers, the, um, the strangely named rivers of the, the Mimram, the Bean, and the Rib, all, all join so that four rivers come together at, at Hartford. And, um, Hartford Castle is where we started the pilgrimage um, and it's one of those places that has, has a history tied in with the Norman Castle that was there. Um, the, the, the current building that, that's on the slide is, is, is a Tudor pier one. But the, um, I have a feeling that the the, the area of around Hartford Castle was, was a, a, a sacred space originally, not, not a place of military or um, strategic significance, um, even though it's, it's evolved into a castle. And um, that's kind of hinted at by the fact that um, in 673, a, a synod was held there, which essentially established the, um, the, the first Church of England. Uh, so 400 years before the Normans were there building their castle, which they get all the credit for, <coughs> this, was, um, this was a place that, that had some sacred significance, um, enough to host a, a, a synod. Um, and I think all the bishops of, of, of Britain except one turned up. Um, it's got a, a, a strange connection to the, um, the Earth Stars um, discovery too, in, in that the, the Camelot site uh, of, of the Earth Stars discovery, the Camelot moat, um, where a, a fortified manor house or small castle um, once stood. Um, when it was demolished in 1439, the, the remains were taken away to, um, to help rebuild the walls of Hartford Castle. Um, so when, when you go and visit Camelot Moat in North London and don't find a, a, a castle there on, 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 the, on the material plane at least, um, that's because it's, it's all been carted off to Hartford and built into the walls. Um, and w when we went here, um, we started the pilgrimage in the grounds beneath a large oak tree um, to, to listen to the, 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 the voice of the site and tell us what, what if anything, that might, useful we might do there. And um, one of the people with us said that, 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 that 
they felt it was something to do with the blending of male and female energies and the balancing of those energies. And, and ten minutes later, when we walked over to the, the castle itself, there was a wedding going on in there. So, um, that that's confirmed that quite nicely. Um, this is an ancient boundary stone that's outside Hartford Castle. Um, and the, in fact, there's another stone nearby that commemorates the Synod. Um, boundary stones, um, again, are, are overlooked in their significance, I feel. It, if, if, if you look at Sir Montague Sharp's uh, book on the, on the ancient history of, of Hertfordshire, he says that the stone itself was sacred and it stood for, for a, a, a local god or um, in the Roman periods, it, it was a god called Terminus, he says, who was the, the god of boundaries. Um, but prior to that, and John Michel confirms this in, in, in uh, View Over Atlantis, uh, these boundary stones were sacred to the Celtic Mercury, who, of course, is, is Lou by, the, by any other name. Um, so, right outside the site of Hartford Castle is, is a, a stone that was probably originally dedicated to, to Lou. Um. <clears throat> and this, this was the second point on our, on our pilgrimage, the, the, the castle mound beside the river where we, um, we did a, uh, one of those simple but wonderful Dr. Emoto blessings to the water of, of, you know, it's a very simple phrase that he uses, um, water, water we bless you, water we thank you, water we love you. And I, I love the simplicity of, 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 of those blessings that he uses and, and we did that at the bank here and then um, um, cast a, a votive offering of the spear of Lou into the waters. It, it was actually a spear that was left over from um, a, a school play. <laughs> but uh, it was the, um, the best we had. Um, and just looking at the castle mound there, it, it reminds me that um, all of these, these castle mounds are, are attributed to the, the Normans. And, and I think it's another grossly unfair thing because the, the Normans were just making use of stuff that was there um, originally and, and it would have been an ancient British energy centre, power centre, a centre of administration um, and the evidence to support that is at, at, at Merlin's Mound at Marlborough School where the, the, um, the legend that Merlin was buried beneath that mound existed before, before the Normans got there um, and carried on after they, they'd long gone. Um, I, I, I suspect that all these mounds are, are, are Merlin's mounds in, in, in one way and, and that he's another aspect of, of, of Lou. And this is um, a strange landscape figure I found on, on, on the map of Hartford. A, 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 to me, it looks like um, a deer, a, a heart, perhaps a, is another word for a deer, but that there it is drinking at the ford in Hartford, and it, it's even got a couple of antlers. Um, <laughs> and um, it's, it's a, a very synchronistic figure. There's, there, there are actually two deers on, on the landscape, but I didn't draw the other one on because it, it, it obscures the initial one. Um, but there, se there seems to be two landscape figures of, of, of deer or hearts at Hartford. Um, and I, I have a feeling, that when, whenever I go to Hartford Castle, and it's the same at Berkhamsted Castle actually, I, I get the feeling that it was a big henge and, and that the stones had been taken away um, and that that was the origin of, of it. A, 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 a sacred enclosure where the rivers formed a, a, a sacred barrier around the henge. Um, 
And so I, I, I think the, the, the area of Hartford Castle and, and Berkhamsted Castle too are, were, were sacred enclosures of, and very important ones. Um, but then we, we, we come on to the figure of, 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 of the, the lion, which is part of the Earth Star's discoveries. It's, it's, it's not as a zodiac, um, because the, there are only three or four landscape figures in the Earth Star's discovery. This, this is part of a pair of figures um, which represent the heraldic guardians, um, and the lion is on the eastern side of, of London, and on the western side is, is a, 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 the figure of a unicorn. Um, which, of course, are the, the heraldic guardians on the crest of, 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 of the Queen and, and, and of, of Britain. And to find them emblazoned on the landscape at this sort of scale is, is rather encouraging and it's surprising, but it's encouraging. It looks as if London is some, under some sort of divine protection. And, and, of course, between the two figures is the geometry of the Earth Star's temple, which... Um, connects up nicely with, uh, with Peter's Grail line through the country, through, um, through the Kingston point of it. Um, I don't believe that, th that this figure is, is um, an ancient thing that's, that's been on the landscape for millions of years. I, I think it's an expression of the spirit of the land and the spirit of the land is alive and well and living and evolving and um, it's been created over time and, and even us humans get to um, lend a hand in, in, in doing things that we don't understand or have no conception of um, uh, because some of these roads that define it are, are, are fairly recent, some of them are old um, but it's, it's something that has come out of the, the, of, the, of the spirit of the land itself, or as, as William Blake would call it, an emanation of Albion, and, and it's manifested as, as a line. And of course, um, when we see these things, there's, there's a part of our brain that, that is always looking for something that's recognizable in form or pattern, and, and uses that to complete the um, the, the interaction between um, our conscious awareness and, and, the, and the spirit of the land of which we are a part. Um, the reason why I have this is that in, in Welsh, lu means lion. So the lion is actually another aspect of, 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 of the Celtic sun god lu, and, and, and that's his river, the river Lee, which runs through the back of the lion, um, the whole the, the line itself extends pretty much into into the city of London and um, up here into Hanolt Forest and Essex. Um, it's defined by this. Whoops. It's, it's defined by this road that goes. Um, down into, into, into northeast London, but it also has the river Roding running alongside that, which could equally be used to define that pattern. Um, so already we've got two images on the landscape of northeast London that, that could relate to Lou as, as an energy within, within the land and, and as part of the spirit of the land. Uh, here we are, this, this is the A113 from Woodford to Chigwell. Um, and as I said, the river roading is um, running alongside it in a slightly more wibbly-wobbly fashion. The paws of, um, of the lion, because it's, it's, it's not a standing lion like the one on the crest, it's, it's, uh, it's more sphinx-like. Um, the paws of the lion go through um, Dagenham. Um, and... The, uh, the, the body of the lion encompasses quite a lot of, of, of northeast London. Um, this, this is a slightly different map showing you some of the more clearly some of the towns uh, around there which are included in the, um, in the figure of the lion. And of course, several of them are, are, 
uh, a strong earth star's point. At one stead, there's the um, St. Gabriel's Church, which is part of a five-point star, and uh, down in East Ham is um, the old St. Mary's Church and Barking Abbey, which are, which are um, some of the key points of the, the earth star's geometry. And even the pathways and, and tracks uh, uh, of the area around the head, there's, there's a, even a strange little crown shape which um, mirrors um, a, the crown that's on the coat of arms, on the lion on the coat of arms. Um, and and the, the coat of arms doesn't date back more than 700 years, really. Um, so um, it's, it's not likely to be an ancient figure at all. Uh, but it does, it does emphasize the kingly, regal nature of, of the lion, which of course is one of its, its attributes, and, and, and the, other one, the other one being solar energy, the, the, the solar lion. Um, this is, this is a, a broader picture of how the um, Earth Star's geometry temple in Greater London um, whoops, fits in with, um, <coughs> with the lion and the, and, and the unicorn. And um, on the crest, the lion is on the, um, on, on the opposite side um, to, to how they stand on the landscape. But the, they do suggest that um, London is under some kind of, of divine protection. And, and also, it, it emphasizes the, 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 the function of, of, of the geometry as a landscape temple, because um, those two landscape figures represent the, 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 the left and right pillars, the, the solar pillar, the, the lunar pillar. Um, of, and, and of course, um, Lou himself, as, as, a, as a figure of Mercury or Hermes, represents the, um, the central figure, figure in, in, in many ways. So, rightly or wrongly, what, what occurred to me was that um, with these images, particularly the, on, on the Essex and Eastern London landscape, the, the images relating to Ludd suggest uh, Lou give the impression that, that, that he's an energy that, that's within the land or sleeps within the land. And, and so it makes a connection to the, 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 the Arthur and Grail myths. Um, and perhaps because Lou is so much older than, than Arthur, who, who was, if he existed, was a 5th or 6th century um, person, um, but clearly, the Arthurian legends were based on a much older tradition, and, and perhaps Lou was the basis of that as, 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 as the king who sleeps within the land. Um, and perhaps he represents the sovereign power in the landscape. Um, and to emphasize that, there's, there's this alignment that runs from St. Paul's up into the head of the lion. I'm sorry the, um, the slide's so dark. Um, this, this is probably the most important alignment of, of, of energy through London. It, it takes in, um, down here, at St. Paul's, Westminster Abbey. Um, several other sites, and up here in the, in the head of the lion, um, it goes through um, a place called Chigwell Row. Um, but it's, it's very much a royal line, and a line connected to the sovereignty of the land. It, it connects um, three sites of coronation, which is the Kingstone at Kingston-on-Thames, where seven Saxon kings were crowned, Westminster Abbey, where our, where our modern royalty um, are, are crowned, and um, St. Paul's, where an open-air druidic moot um, was used to select 
um, the, the next king in an election by his, by his people and, and his peers. Um, and that, that's fallen, into, um, fallen out of, of practice these days. The, the um, last king to, um, to undergo that procedure uh, before his inauguration, I think, was Henry III. Um, but um, quite a lot of the Plantagenet kings submitted themselves to uh, an election by the, their public in, in, in the grounds of St. Paul's on the north side of the cathedral. Um, and Edmund Ironsides was, was one, uh, Edward the Confessor was, was another. And if, if they didn't get elected um, by their people and their, their, their peers in, in, in St. Paul's, they didn't get crowned at Westminster. It was, uh, it was that important. And these, these are some of the, um, the mark points on the line. Um, there's, there's a few strangely modern ones in there, like the Peace Pagoda in Battersea Park. Um, and the, the point in Kingston is, is, um, it is probably the, the, the parish church where the, the, the stone was originally was kept in the parish church um, for, for quite a long time before it was moved a few hundred yards down the road to uh, outside the law courts. Um, but in, in central London it goes through um, Westminster Abbey, Houses of Parliament, Jubilee Gardens, um, it clips the edge of County Hall and the Oxo Tower, um, goes through St Andrews by the wardrobe strangely named church, which sounds like it's got something to do with Ikea, but uh, I think it was uh, Edward IV had a, had a storage place for his, his extensive clothes round the corner. Um, through St Paul's and St Vedast and, and the lovely ruins of St Mary Aldermanbury, um, which is on the corner of Love Lane, um, just round the corner from the Guildhall. Um, through Moorgate Station, which I'm told is the former site of a nunnery, but I haven't found the reference to that yet. And then um, through a couple of modern chapels and through the mount at Arnold Circus, which is a, a, a strange mound whose, whose antiquity is disputed hotly by, by various people. But it, it, uh, it's, as well as being on this line, it's, it's on at least three other alignments. Um, linking sites of antiquity. Um, so my suspicion is that, that, um, that it's a genuine mound or, or, or that it marks the site of, of, of something else that was, was pretty ancient. And uh, it goes through what may be the possible site of the Leighton Stone um, and ends up at the crossroads in Chigwell Row um, in the head of the lion. Um, where there's a, a, um, a pub called the Maypole, which suggests a ritual site. Um, and it's at, it's at a crossroads on a hilltop. There's a, there's a church about 50 yards down the road with some wonderful old yews in it. And um, to confirm, uh, in, in, in the old straight track, Alfred Watkins actually regarded um, crossroads as, as valid mark points for, for lays and, and, and stretches of old road and where this alignment goes up to the crossroads near the Maypole pub, um, it actually follows the road into the, into the crossroads, it, it runs along, along it. Um, and a few hundred yards down the road in the opposite direction is a pub called the Camelot, just to, just to add to the weird synchronicities. Um, this, this is the mount at, at Arnold Circus, which um, um, in an old book on, on, on the gypsy language, the, the, there's a reference to it and it says that it was, it was demolished and flattened after the time of popery. Uh, but I, I have a sneaking suspicion that what they mean was, um, the, the word they used was levelled. And I, I think this was as, as big as... Uh, as Merlin's Mound at, uh, at Marlborough or originally, and, and they've levelled it down to 30 or 40 feet. Um, 
because the, the, the mound is certainly still there. Um, this is the, the, the ruins of St. Mary Aldermanbury at the corner of Love Lane, and that's, um, that's a wonderful, tranquil place, um, frequently used by city workers to have their, um, their, their lunch. Um, and that's the, um, the Kingstone at, at Kingston on Thames. A couple of sites that aren't listed there is, is the Priory of St. John at Old. The line seems to go through um, just before it gets to the, the mound at, um, at Arnold Circus. And also um, the, the um, beneath the, the Guild Hall is, is an amphitheatre which, which is said to be Roman and, and the line also clips the edge of that. Um, so it's, it's pretty well marked. And um, <clears throat> to my mind, this is, this is an axis of, of, of solar energy, of, 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 of the real power of the, of the sun, and, and it's, it represents the power of the sacred king um, and, and the, the, the sovereign. It's, it's also got a caduceus effect in the way that it, it snakes, the, 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 the Thames snakes around it. And between Kingston and, and um, St. Paul's, the, the, the Thames crosses the alignment seven times. So you have this wonderful blending of, of the water and the fire energy of, of this midsummer sunrise alignment, uh, working like a real caduceus on the landscape. Um, this, this is the point at Chigwell Row where, where, where this royal alignment um, ends up. And because that's, um, that was the Maypole pub there, it, it suggests a, a, a celebration at Beltane at May Day. So I, I, I worked out the May Day sunrise there and it goes back to Primrose Hill, which is, is also a great place of, of ritual and even today used by um, the Druid Order for, for, for marking the eight ceremonies of the year. And taking a parallel to that through, <coughs> um, through St. Paul's, there the could be, um, this, this is a, either a Beltane alignment or a Lunasad alignment, and whereas the, the the corridor line, the royal line, goes through the north side of the Olympic Village. The, the Lunasad alignment um, would go right through the, um, the, the Olympic Park, the main arena. Um, and I, I've only recently um, been investigating this, so I haven't plotted all the, um, the sites along that line. And um, in fact, I haven't plotted many of them at all. But it's, it seems likely that, the, that when I do, some interesting things will, will turn up, but um, again, it's, it's, it seems beyond coincidence that, that the, the Midsummer Sunrise alignment from, from Ludgate Hill, St. Paul's, is, is going to take in the, um, the Olympic Village north side, and, and, and the Lunasad alignment and Beltane alignments will, will actually go through the south side and through, right through the Olympic Stadium. And that got me thinking, um, is one of those alignments loose Spear of Light, which, which is talked about in legend? Um, and of course, literally, they're all axes of, of, of light. They're, they're, they're axes of, of, of power and vision and, and, and solar energy. Um, even, though, even though Lu is not a sun god, um, he does seem to be associated with the light of the sun and, and um, the, the sovereignty of the, of the sacred king. Um, and so I, I began to think of this, um, this midsummer sunrise axis that, that connects the lion um, who is Lou to, to, to Ludgate Hill, which may be named after Lou. Um, I began to think of that as, as, as Lou's spear or sword. 
And then I stumbled upon the fact that Sir Thomas Mallory very clearly says that in, in Mort d'Arthur that the Arthur drew the sword from the stone in the churchyard of the greatest church in London, um, which would have been St. Paul's because Westminster Abbey was outside the city in, in, in those days. And um, so out of this solar alignment is, is the, maybe the site where, where Arthur's sovereignty arose. And so we, at one end of it, we have, we have the sleeping lion in the land, and, and at the other end of it, we have the, um, the once and future king claiming his power. So this, this is a very important alignment linked to the sovereignty of Britain and the royal line of Grail kings. Um, And it actually goes right through the spot where Sir Thomas Mallory says King Arthur pulled the sword from the stone. Um, uh, because he, he describes it as, as a stone in the north side of the churchyard, close, close to the altar. And um, in fact, the, there was a stone in exactly that position. <coughs> And this is what marks the, 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 the site of that stone. It's, it's Paul's cross, the original Paul's cross. Uh, but it, originally it was called Old Paul's cross, P-O-L, or Old Paul's stump, which referred to the, the stump of the stone that was left into, into which the cross was set. And it was very common practice um, years ago to take a megalithic stone and, and put a cross in it to Christianize it. So there, there are quite a few examples in Cornwall where many, many more stones remain. Um, and also, um, its position on this mid midsummer sunrise axis may mean that it was actually a king stone, um, which was set outside the main circle of stones uh, if there was a megalithic monument here, just as the king stone at the Rollwright stone still is. Um, marking the midsummer sunrise there, um, or the heel stone at Stonehenge, and I, I, I think the heel stone name actually comes from Helios, Helios the sun, Helios Apollo. Um, um, although that is a, that's a Greek name for him, but the the the, the Druid Greek. There's, uh, there's a strange story in one of John Michel's books uh, about um, a traveller who was w walking in, in Ireland and um, he lost his, lost his way and the, the first person he came across was a young shepherd um, tending his sheep and, and the, the shepherd, unbeknown to him, was under the tutelage of a, of a, of a local hedge druid and when, when the guy asked him for directions, he couldn't understand English, but he could reply in, in, in ancient Greek that the Druid had spoken to him. <laughs> and that, that's in, uh, in, in one of John Michel's books of old articles that he wrote in the Oldie magazine. So here we, here we are at, Stone, at um, St. Paul's, where there may have been a stone, and it may have been the stone that, that Arthur drew the sword from. Um, this, this is the current um, Paul's Cross, um, which is uh, a monument that dates back uh, only um, 150, 160 years, and it was put up as, as a monument. Um, it's a little bit of information about the Druid moot that was held in the, in the northern part of the churchyard. It, it was held three times a year. Um, and the midsummer solstice was one of the times that it was traditionally held, and the midwinter solstice was, was, um, it was, was another time that it was traditionally held. The, the third occasion um, is most likely to be neither Beltane or Lunasad, but uh, it's not recorded. Um, and of course, when there was going to be a coronation or something, they, they would hold an impromptu one beyond those three times. And, of course, everyone 
in the, in the guidebook, it'll tell you that old Paul's cross and old Paul relate to St. Paul, but nowhere in, else in the world is he referred to as Paul. And when I was working with this intuitively, I was, I was told that it wasn't Paul, it was Apollo. And so Paul's cross, the, where the stone was, is, is on, on a midsummer sunrise alignment on a stone that was dedicated to Apollo, the sun god. Um, and may have been a king stone of a megalithic monument. Um, the other interesting thing there is that the, the East Saxons who in, in, inhabited London um, also had a sun god called Balder, Balder the Beautiful, and um, he was also called Pol. Um, by an, uh, it, it was a name also used for Balder. So whoever you choose to think Paul was, he, he, was, he was the sun god, not, um, not old St. Paul. Um, so that, there we have it. This, this was a place where, where kings were made and what they were doing was tapping into... What, the, the, I, I got a feeling that the coronation process um, was rather like the, the process in, in Egypt where, where the pharaoh became the living embodiment of, of the sun god. And I think that the, the sacred kings of Britain underwent the same thing at their coronation. They, they, were, they were crowned with the glory and the power of the sun. The crown actually represents the, the, the glory of the sun, the corona. Uh, that's where the word comes from. Um, so when the king was crowned, he was taking on, on, on the, uh, the incarnation of the powers of, 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 the, of the sun god of the time, who, who may have been Lu, uh, but in more recent times is, is, is Apollo. Um, we have a statue there where, where Apollo is depicted as, as, as the Greek Mercury with, with a bow and arrow. Um, but it seems likely as well that this, this stone was related to, to, to Lu uh, as much as the, um, the later gods. And um, as I said, the, the stone was exactly where Mallory said it ought to be. So this makes a very important alignment linked to the sovereignty of Britain and the royal line of Grail kings. Arthur was, was, was Pendragon. And, and Pendragon even today is, is a title within the Druid order and the head of the dragon. Um, and you can translate that as, as someone who controls the dragon force. Um, and the, the, the symbolism of drawing the sword from the stone re represents um, the conscious or willful control of that earth energy through that spot. Um, the conscious control of the dragon energy or the fiery energy of, of this alignment. And by pulling the sword from the stone on this alignment, Arthur took control of, of that power and became the embodiment of, of, of the sun god, whoever it was. And so, Lu may be the pre-Arthurian embodiment of the king who sleeps within the land. And his power is still flowing through that, that alignment. And it's, it's still there for us to tap into in, a, in our own way. Um, last, last year, um, we had two, two groups that did pilgrimages to, to, the, um, to St. Paul's to, to draw our own swords of power from the location of the old stone. And it was, it was a very interesting experience. It's a very empowering thing. I, I, I recommend that, that, that anyone who can get there on the solstice next year goes, goes along and, and the, the, they conveniently put benches all around where, where the stone 
was. So you can sit on the bench and you can, you can visualise the stone there or its etheric counterpart. And, 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 and of course, all this was organised by Merlin's power. Um, he, was, he was the um, element behind the scenes that, that arranged it all. And so um, you might find his presence there as well. Um, I, I was quite surprised to, um, to, to, to sense um, that when, when we did the exercise. But um, this link to the Arthurian myths and legends is, is, runs all through the Earth Star's discovery. Um, the, it began at, virtually at a place that's still called Camelot today. And... and um, was actually a, 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 had a, a, a castle um, there. And, and many people, including myself, believe that there's an inner world grail castle at that particular site that's accessible. And of course, the Earth star's geometry is, is virtually identical to the uh, geometry that was used to lay out the stones of Stonehenge, which um, in myth was, was put there by Merlin's art. So if Stonehenge is Merlin's art, so is the Earth Star's geometry. Um, and then in amongst it, we have this amazing alignment that, that identifies um, the, the place where Arthur drew the sword from the stone. And raises the question of does Arthur's stone still exist? And I, I think it does. Um, because less than a quarter of a mile from St. Paul's is the London Stone, which is said to be the foundation stone of the city. Um, and, the, and the foundation myth of, of the city revolves around Brutus the Trojan, who set up his foundation stone on Ludgate Hill um, to mark the foundation of the city and also the foundation of, of his temple of Diana, um, Diana Artemis. Um, but if that's the case, the foundation stone should be on Ludgate Hill, where the temple of Diana is, is supposed to be, uh, and which it was the center of, of, of Brutus's city. It, it should be up there on the hill, not down here in, in Cannon Street, stuck in the wall of a Chinese bank. Um, and there's, there's no doubt there was a temple of Diana on Ludgate Hill because the, um, there is a, a, a temple, in, um, in, uh, an altar, a Roman altar dedicated to Diana that was unearthed when um, Goldsmiths Hall was developed in the, in, in the 1860s. And I, I don't believe it's ever been put on public display. It's, it's, it's on display inside Goldsmiths Hall, but of course that's not open to the public. But, the, but there it is, um, a Diana altar that, that was found on Ludgate Hill a uh, hundred yards or so from St. Paul's. Um, and, of, and of course, there's, there's, there's the Diana Chambers as well on the, on the south side of St. Paul's, the, uh, the, the underground chambers that, that were discovered when Wren excavated um, the ruins of the old cathedral um, to build the new one. Um, and I think Wren actually incorporated a lot of what he found into, into the cathedral. Um, if there was um, a, a classic temple of Diana there, it's still there in, in, in the basement, recreated as that circle of eight pillars that, that's beneath the dome. Um, and that's how the, um, the London stone used to look when it was set into the wall of St. Swithin's church, um, which stood, stood next to where um, it, it currently is. Um, St. Swithin's was demolished in 1972, I think. Um, to make way for a, one of those lovely office blocks that Prince Charles loves so much. <laughs> um, and that's, that's what it looks like if you shove your camera through the, um, through the grill and try and get a photograph of the stone. It's not very big. It, it, it looks like it might be the top of a, of a stone or, or indeed a stump, which would tie in with Paul's, Paul's stump. Um, 
Currently, you're not allowed in the building to take photographs from, from the inside of it because it's being redeveloped. And um, I, would, I was really amazed to find that the developer doing this, this building work is called Minerva. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, it's part of the, um, the Walbrook development. And, and um, at one point, the London Stone was going to be thrown in a skip by builders who were um, working on the building. Um, and the, the, the bank, Chinese bank had been temporarily replaced by a sports shop. Um, where the, the, the manager of the shop realized that, that this was a, a treasured antiquity and, and got them to take it out of the skip and leave it where it was. Um, but, but since then, the, the um, Museum of London have taken an interest and, and, and the developers have been alerted to it. And, and um, if it is moved, it will go to the London Museum while, while a redevelopment takes place and then be put back in a, in a place designed for it. And, um, there, there would be moves afoot for it to be done with a proper druid ceremony. Um, so th that's pretty much pretty much it. Um, to to re reiterate, actually, what P Peter ended his talk with yesterday: the wisdom and, and of the ancient druids is is an open secret, and it's it's on public display all around us in nature encoded in our sacred landscapes and in our ancient sacred sites and it just takes us to go and look for these things and ob observe nature as our ancestors did. Um, and so, some things are, 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 are more difficult to find than others. I, th I think um, Nick's discovery from, discoveries from Ravebury are something I wouldn't have ever found because <laughs> um, it requires that specialist um, astrological knowledge, um, but there's plenty out there for, for us to find, and um, um, if I'm in London at next summer solstice, um, I'd like to invite you to join me at St. Paul's and um, have a dabble with, uh, with Lou's spear <laughs> or Arthur's sword, whichever way you look at it. and. Um, before we end, as, as the spear, as loose spear of light goes through the Olympic Stadium, um, I'm, I'm very tempted to put a tenor on Britain getting a, a, an Olympic in gold in the javelin. <laughs> <laughs> um, and on that silly note, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, for anyone who wants to read more about that, my, my book London's Camelot has the, um, the information about Arthur Stone and... and um, um, Arthurian connections, um, the coronation lines in the ley line book, and, and the uh, visionary landscape book. So, um, thank you for, for, for listening. Oh, crikey, I've gone over, over, over the time a bit.